National Museum of Racing and Hall of Fame. Welcome to this installment of Storytime with Horse Explorers. I am so excited this afternoon to share this story with you. Actually, we're gonna just read the first half today. We'll save the second half for the next time. Um, but this is an inspiring story, an important story, written by our friend, Patsy Trollinger. And the illustrations in this book were paintings that were adapted uh, to be published here by Jerome Lagarig. And I wanna thank our friends, Patsy and Jerome, for allowing to share their work with us and also Benjamin Press. Thank you so much. Let's get started with this story about a special man and a special jockey named Isaac Murphy. Isaac walked quickly through the streets of Lexington, carrying a large basket as if it weighed nothing at all. He was short for a boy of 12, but strong. His arms had grown used to the heavy work he did for his mother's laundry business, carrying water, setting up wash tubs, delivering finished loads of laundry. His grandparents had been slaves, and now Isaac was free, but Kentucky had very few schools for black students. He spent every day working with his mother. On that spring day in 1873, Isaac made a delivery to the Owings house at the perfect time. Mr. Owings owned a stable of racehorses, and he needed to hire some new jockeys. The strong boy behind the laundry basket was just the right size for riding. Mr. Owings asked a question. Would Isaac like to learn how to ride a thoroughbred? The answer was yes. So early the next morning, Isaac tried to ride a volcano. Not a real mountain of fire, but a horse. Isaac had seen plenty of elegant thoroughbreds and he expected to ride a prince of a horse. But what did the men bring out to the paddock? A nervous young animal named Volcano. Isaac tried his best to ride, but the colt bucked, reared high, and dumped him to the ground. First day, first ride, nothing like he had imagined. Isaac still was wiping dust from his eyes when the men asked him to try again. Sore but determined, Isaac climbed back on the horse. This time, he stayed on. With that successful ride, Isaac earned a place in jockey school. He wouldn't sit at a desk with a book though. In this school, every classroom was a stable and every lesson was a horse. It was a place where Isaac could strengthen his muscles and his mind. One man was his teacher, boss, and friend, Eli Jordan, the trainer. Eli's job was to teach thoroughbreds and jockeys how to win races. Inside the barn, Eli explained how to feed and groom the horses, and outside on the practice track, he used one word more than any other, pace. Isaac soon figured out that pace was a mixture of speed, strategy, and time. A jockey with perfect pace knew when to let the horse run full tilt down the track and when to save energy for a final burst of speed at the finish line. Eli's lessons about pace were difficult. Isaac had to memorize how fast every horse could run and notice things that made each horse unique. The big bay stallion hit top speed when he was leading other horses. The brown filly was just the opposite. She liked to chase other horses and pass them. If Isaac raced on the bay, he would set a fast pace all the way. On the filly, he might start slow, then finish with a final burst of speed. Some of Isaac's best lessons came at coffee time, when the older jockeys sat on bales of hay swapping stories. One man described a racetrack with a dangerous low spot at the quarter mile mark. Another man bragged about urging a lazy horse to victory in a rainstorm. During two years of jockey school, Isaac listened and remembered. Finally, he was ready to race. On the morning of his first race, Isaac carefully buttoned the bright yellow shirt Eli brought to him. 
The silk racing shirt and matching cap announced that Isaac was a real jockey. At the starting line, he became part of a patchwork of colors, each representing a different stable. Isaac focused on one small piece of red, the starter's flag. It happened suddenly. The starter lowered that flag and all the horses lunged forward, so crowded that they bumped another. A cloud of dust sprayed Isaac's head and stung his eyes. Chunks of dirt flew up and hit his legs. He was supposed to think about timing and tick off each second in his head, but his counting disappeared into the noise of pounding hoofs. Before Isaac had time to think clearly, before he could set a pace, the race was over and he didn't win. By the time he wore the yellow silks again, Isaac had learned how to concentrate. There was noise all around him, but Isaac had ears only for the strong, steady breathing of the horse. From the moment the race began, the seconds ticked clearly in his head. 58, he told himself at the half mile mark. 114 as the one mile mark slipped by. On the final stretch, the dust and noise faded away. Isaac and his horse were headed for victory. His timing had been perfect. Other wins followed. Suddenly, horse owners all over the country wanted Isaac to ride for them. He began racing at tracks in New York, Michigan, and Missouri. And no matter where he rode or what color silks he wore, Isaac kept on winning. So we'll stop here for today. We'll finish the second half of the book the next time we're together. Until then, go to our website and you'll see that we have some activities for you to work on at home if you want to learn more about Isaac Murphy. If you have any questions at any time, email me at rferraro at racingmuseum.net. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much and bye for now.